Hi, everyone. This panel is called Crypto and the Environment, a very hot topic, um, a problem to solve. The topic of the environment is obviously generally used as a critique of the cryptocurrency industry um, and something negative. So we hope to break down some of those myths and stereotypes and just get into the digging a little deeper. Um, so first things first is obviously I would like to introduce myself and the panelists briefly. I am head of content at OKX, which is a big cryptocurrency exchange and ecosystem. Um, I will pass on the intro to Shiti first. Go ahead. Thanks, Olivia. Pleased to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Shiti. I serve as Chief Marketing Officer at Stepin. A little bit about Stepin for those who don't know. Um, we are a Web3 fitness app that employee moved to earn. So essentially, users download our app from Apple App Store or uh, Android App Store and then buy NFT sneakers. And as they walk, jog, or run, they can earn NFT tokens, badges, rewards. Uh, we have two tokens, GST and GMT, that they earn in the app, um, leveling up, minting new sneakers, and several in-game features. And uh, we have three missions that are dear to us. One is nudging millions, if not billions, of people to healthy lifestyles while connecting them to Web3, so building this bridge, the holy grail between Web2 and Web3, and last but not the least, contribute positively towards carbon neutrality. So as we onboard more users, we are now 800,000 daily active users, 3 million monthly users, over 50 million NFT sales um, daily. Uh, we make sure that we are reaching out do not just crypto natives, but non crypto natives, a third of our users are non crypto natives, and making sure that it happens outside. Um, there's a reason why our app doesn't work in the gyms because we want, we want people to move outdoors with their friends, families, pets, social, in a social setting. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what we do towards carbon neutrality a bit down the line. So over to you guys. Thank you, Shiti. Okay, so Raphael, you can go ahead next. Thanks. Uh, my name is Raphael. I'm uh, one of the founders at Toucan Protocol and the CEO. Um, Toucan Protocol is a project that um, builds bridges also. As you mentioned bridges, we built a bridge between the off-chain carbon registries and the on-chain carbon markets. So really our, our goal is to build technology that can unlock climate action at scale. and um, We've launched last year in October and since have bridged 22 million carbon credits um, onto the Polygon network. And we're now going multi-chain um, in the direction of Celo next and uh, have like other, other goals that I, I think we can touch on probably later. Um, but yeah, in general, I think what, we, what we're excited about is really to use crypto to address climate change. And um, so it's the perfect panel to be on because... Crypto has this bad rap. I think personally that um, crypto has a role to play in solving climate change because climate change is a coordination failure and a market failure. And we have the opportunity with crypto to use uh, smart contracts and other coordination mechanisms to address it. And like, yeah, I'll leave it there, but um, I'm really excited to be here and uh, dig a little bit deeper into, into this topic. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Andre, our final panelist. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being on, on the panel. Uh, my name is Andre Van Robin, CEO and founder of uh, Plastics and parent company Nozama. Uh, Plastics is a marketplace where waste management companies, recycling companies, consumer brands, consumers, and artists come together to reduce uh, uh, waste and plastic specifically in the environment. Our vision is that all plastic production across the world has to be identified and traceable, and all parties using, consuming, or distributing plastic have to be accountable. We currently have more than 15,000 tons of plastics reduced and recovered from the environment, and we're operating in Africa, Australia, Latin America, North America, and Europe. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. So 
Uh, as you can see, our panel is very qualified to talk about sustainability um, and the environment in crypto. Before we dig into the first questions, I just want to mention for anyone watching that we will be taking questions from the audience in the last five minutes of this discussion. Um, we we will, it's a 30 minute panel, so um, in about 25 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, you can share your questions. I believe there's a Discord for that. So um, I... Yeah, I will jump right in so we can start. So we're going to get to, we're going to talk about proof of work, proof of stake, and we're going to talk about NFTs for sure. Um, that's the obviously the new big topic in crypto that people are criticizing for its environmental impact. Um, Bitcoin has bared the brunt of that for the whole time before. Um, so just to set the stage, right? Uh, if the kind of overall commonly used argument against um, cryptocurrency, uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, a proof of work system, uh, or many NFTs, is that they are bad for the environment, destroying the planet. Just can can anyone give their take on that question? Um, sort of, is that the right question to ask? And from there, we can move into sort of like how your projects are addressing it. Just, I just want to establish first up that energy consumption is not equivalent to carbon emissions. Um, there's an important distinction to be made, how much energy a system consumes and how much carbon it emits. For example, one unit of hydro energy will have a much less environmental impact than, say, uh, a unit of coal-powered energy. Uh, so you can, you can calculate Bitcoin's energy consumption relatively easily with hash rate, which is a total... Uh, combined computational power used to mine Bitcoin and process translations. And then you can make some educated guesses to energy requirements of the hardware that miners are using. But the uh, requ requirements of this uh, then vary as to what source of renewable energy does this consumption that uh, take. So, for example, one report suggests that 73% of Bitcoin's energy consumption was carbon neutral. Um, and then the next year, a report suggests 39% um, mm -hmm. is carbon uh, renewable. So uh, there's lack of data verification and there's a lot of variability. And there's a poor correlation between consumption and environmental impact. Um, I mean, there are several sources that are now being used. Hydro is a good one. Flared natural gas is a good one. There's a uh, differentiation between wet climates and the dry climates. I mean, the two the two um, states in China, which uh, are which are now um, big centers for this energy for Bitcoin mining. That's for a reason because they're able to use hydro. The point I'm trying to make is that it's important to differentiate and. Web3 can be used to counter the worst of Web3. And uh, in fact, I, I'd invite uh, Rafael, who's much more qualified to talk about this um, than I am because he's building on it. And then maybe I can talk about how Stepin is contributing towards it. Thanks, Vicky. Uh, it's a great foundation to lay. And now I, I can take it one step further because I, I spend a lot of time trying to understand the carbon footprint of uh, one transaction. And how to attribute, like you know, an attribute, how to attribute a carbon footprint from one transaction to the person, and it's extremely difficult, right? Because um, what the, the 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 thing that many people have done, like in, in the case of Ethereum, is to use the gas that is being used for a transaction, for instance, to say, okay, this represents the utility that a user, like you know, it represents kind of the space, the block space that somebody is consuming, and so you can attribute that to um, to the person, you know, submitting the transaction, it's their carbon footprint. But um, if you dig a little deeper, it's like, what are really the things that drive the, the the emissions of a of a layer one blockchain? It's really, as you said, the hash rate, and the hash rate increases when the price increases, also, right? So there's an argument to be made that like somebody buying a cryptocurrency, which moves the price up significantly, is actually, you know, creating incentives for miners to come online, which increases the um, carbon footprint and somebody selling, you know, right now, like the price is going down is like, it's it's really good for the environment in a way, right? So there's these like, it's really hard, what I'm trying to get at is it's really hard to attribute the um, emissions that come from Web3 to a single transaction or even to a single user. 
Um, so I'm saying this because I believe that we need to like systemically look at these systems and how we and how can we get these systems to be carbon neutral. Um, because it's so hard to like say, you know, it's, you know, you have to offset this much or you have to do this or you have to do this. Um, but the beauty, as you said, GT is like, uh, we can use Web3 to do that, right? So for, you can, for instance, bring in carbon credits from chain. It's a great way to drive climate finance directly to projects to reduce carbon emissions. And since they're tokens, we can use them to program programmatically offset emissions. Um, but obviously offsetting is not, you know, uh, like a solution for everything. So I think, you know, thinking about ways to reduce the emission should be the first step. And the second step is like all the emissions that we cannot get rid of uh, is to offset those. But um, yeah, just like highlighting what Shady said, it's the data is still extremely poor because we don't know where all these miners sit, um, which makes it really hard. I, I personally think the, the question is one of a business model uh, question. Uh, we all use email. There was a point in time uh, before uh, most of you were born <laughs> where email did not uh, did not exist, um, and uh, now it's uh, inexorably part of our our lives. Um, and uh, we don't question its uh, usage. We just try to measure its uh, carbon impact. And obviously, to reduce the email carbon impact is uh, well uh, use less email, uh, make sure the energy on the servers is renewable, etc. Uh, email responded to a need, uh, a business need, a cultural need, uh, uh, and just as uh, blockchain is responding to a need uh, that uh, the world is inexorably going towards. So the question of uh, whether it's uh, good or bad for the environment, uh, I think, uh, is a question that should be transferred into how can we minimize its impact until the real question of renewable energy uh, permeating through all aspects of society is achieved. Uh, because in the meantime, the economy evolves. In the meantime, society demands the functionalities of blockchain. In the meantime, society demands the functionalities of, of uh, uh, Web uh, 3.0. Um, and therefore, uh, what can we do to minimize the evolution uh, of society? Well, the offsetting, as uh, Rafael and uh, Shiti have said, uh, is, and this is one of the reasons why we chose Silo blockchain, uh, because for the time being, we can offset, uh, obviously, the transactions that we're doing, uh, but also from a perspective of uh, really trying to uh, build a model uh, that will fund the regenerative projects. Uh, and in the terms of plastics wastes, this is what we decide to focus on, on uh, waste reduction uh, through the uh, financing mechanisms that the sale of the NFTs provides. Um, and then obviously the real problem in our case is collect plastic. Make sure it doesn't go into the environment, make sure it doesn't go, uh, make sure it's properly disposed of. Uh, carbon, uh, of carbon uh, emissions, make sure you're using uh, um, uh, renewable energies. Uh, but it, the responsibility is of mitigation, uh, not of critique. It's uh, the business plan that has to be uh, uh, taken into account. Uh, how can you use the technology to improve uh, a, a need? Uh, and then obviously in the meantime, mitigate that impact whilst the in energy industry uh, provides the transition into renewable energy. So I think uh, people who criticize uh, blockchain uh, for this, it, it's a, uh, a cheap criticism uh, because then criticize the internet, uh, criticize uh, industrialization. Uh, it's inexorably part of our society. We have to mitigate this damage until we have full uh, renewable energy. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really important point about type of energy, right? The grid, the way that the grid works and not just singling out crypto and blockchain as like needing to do more work than other um, industries and and sectors in order to be sustainable. So in terms of like this, there is an argument that Bitcoin miners would say, could say that proof of work is um is actually a way to do that. You hinted towards that. So a way to bring different renewable energy resources onto grids to incentivize bringing them onto grids um, because that would otherwise be potentially unprofitable. Basically, that's like the debate that's happening. So I'm wondering what you think of that argument that Bitcoin, obviously the biggest proof of work um, cryptocurrency, could be the key to the key to reducing reliance on fossil fuels um, could encourage reducing reliance on fossil fuels. I think yes, 
both in terms of um, resources um, and kind of energies that we use, as well as the geolocations, because the key thing is Bitcoin can use energy that other industries can't. What I mean by that is almost all of the energy currently being used worldwide must be produced relatively close to the end users. Whereas Bitcoin doesn't have such limitation, which enables miners to utilize power source that are inaccessible for most other applications. And like I was saying, hydro is a good example of that. Um, in the in the wet season, for example, uh, the, the two provinces, uh, Sichuan and Yunnan, enormous quantities of renewable hydro energy are wasted every single year. In these areas, production capacity massively outpaces local demand. And battery technology is right now not mature enough to make it worthwhile to store and transport energy from these rural areas to the urban centers that need it. And therefore, what has happened is that these regions um, most likely represent the single largest stranded energy resource on the planet. And therefore, what happened is that it's not a coincidence that these provinces became the heartlands of mining in China. They're responsible for almost 10% of global, bit mine, uh, global Bitcoin mining in the dry season and 50% in the wet season. So there's a, there's a proof here. There's a case study here. I think um, Nick Grossman wrote a point on like Bitcoin being a battery that I think kind of touches on that, which is Bitcoin being essentially an economic battery that... Um, allows um, people to transform energy that would otherwise have been wasted into value, right? Uh, similar to how in Iceland, they have a lot of like aluminium production because, you know, the energy there is really cheap. Aluminium production is extremely energy intensive and essentially producing aluminium is a way for them to transform energy into uh, some value that can then easily be shipped, right? Um, I think that's an interesting, I think it's a really interesting take. I I personally don't think that we are yet at the point where we can say Bitcoin is a solution to transitioning to a more regenerative or like carbon neutral society. I, I think uh, we're still far away from that um, because not all energy that is being used uh, to mine is necessarily comes from waste, waste energy that would otherwise have been wasted. And obviously, we also have to take the the kind of life cycle of the, the mining um rigs into consideration right because there's like a, a cost also in like, producing more and more like uh, miners like physical hardware um so you know i think it's a bit of oversimplification of a problem but I, again i think like everything in life the, the answer is always like in the middle there's like no black and white and i think um bitcoin mining is not just bad for the environment but it's also definitely not good for the environment. That's kind of my position. And for two, can we've taken the decision not to be in a proof of work blockchain for that reason? Um, because it doesn't really make sense for us to build a, a infrastructure for a like web free native carbon market on on a system that inherently um, burns energy to be alive. Bitcoin is not the solution. It was born out of becoming of trying to find a mathematical solution to the problem of trust. Uh, and the Byzantine problem is one of them, obviously. So uh, proof of stake is an evolutionary step towards uh, mitigating the carbon footprint of the mathematical problem. And there will be new protocols over time that will evolve to mitigate the carbon footprint. So ultimately, uh, in hindsight, uh, the efforts of trying to justify the existence of Bitcoin in fitting it into some model, uh, I think, uh, uh, is not the way to look at it. The way to look at it is how can you solve the trust problem mathematically with the least energy footprint possible and then, sup and then supplying the proper energy uh, that is renewable. Uh, so eventually I see uh, future generations of uh, crypto evolving into uh, 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 close to close to zero emissions uh, impact uh, and then obviously uh, combining that with the uh, uh, renewable energy. So the, the, the responsibility of all miners uh, is to uh, get uh, access to renewable energy. The responsibility uh, of blockchainers is to come up with solutions mathematically that can emulate Bitcoin's solidity. And that, yes, Bitcoin is super solid in resolving the mathematical problem of trust. So ultimately, the big technical challenge is how can we evolve Bitcoin into going into the least carbon footprint uh, calculation? That is my personal opinion. Right. So I think when the reason this debate is so important is because there could be different goals here, right? The reason that a blockchain would use proof of 
work is for security, or that's primarily is the reason. So if we dig into you know different use cases, for example, NFTs, um, digital digital ownership and items, do you know do they also need the security properties of a the most maximally decentralized type of network like Bitcoin, which is proof of work, which which is the sort of the ultimate trustless system, as you described, um, or which which makes sense for for a global financial system, I would say. But for uh, something like video game items or other use cases uh, for for digitally owned items on a blockchain, maybe they don't they don't need the same security level. And I bring up security because when we talk about proof of work, proof of stake, I, I, I definitely think in the mainstream, there's potentially a lack of awareness as to, well, why would you choose the other one, right? Like, why don't you choose the green option? And the, this panel is all people who have projects on proof of stake blockchains. So I just need wanted to balance it out and bring that up and sort of transition into the other frame the use cases and maybe talk about um, yeah, how this argument has been made against NFTs, how this argument about lack of sustainability is potentially stopping NFTs from gaining even more mainstream adoption. So that's that's where I want to throw the topic at this point. I feel like I need to say something about it. So um, the topic of NFTs has just, it's just that a different crowd has come to crypto. And um, this is why it's been getting more attention, right? Like the this like energy situation of like crypto has always been the topic and it's just like NFTs. Suddenly we have users that are more mindful of the environment. And this, I think is why it's become uh, more of a kind of topic to be, to be discussed. I personally believe that we're not going to get to the next billion users if we don't solve the environmental problems that uh, blockchains bring, right? Like if we don't decarbonize crypto, I think it has no future. That obviously, you know, that's maybe a strong statement, but um, um, I really believe that if you look at like where the world goes in terms of like, um, you know, e both like from ESG, but also like the, the speed at which we like are driving towards the climate crisis or maybe already in it. Like, I don't think that a system that doesn't address that and is kind of like blocking that out can survive in the long run. So I would really like urge everyone working in the industry to take this seriously because I think it's a blocker for um, it's a blocker for really the, the, the wide adoption of, of, of crypto and we all want that right because we all are we all believe that this is a new way a new paradigm and a, a better system ultimately but if we don't address the climate problem of it then I don't think it can succeed then on the NFT side I mean we see a lot of NFT projects kind of shifting towards the the, the edges right of like going onto blockchains that are like uh, less energy intensive, and uh, I think there's good reasons for that. It's not only the environmental side of it; it's also the financial side of it, right? Because um, there's not just the carbon footprint; there's also the gas cost. And um, so, I think for a lot of NFT applications, we don't actually need that level of security. And I think you know, uh, Shiti, you can probably talk about this a lot more than than, than I can. But um, um, for us, you know, and it's two consistent. There's also NFTs, and like uh, we. Like we're happy that we are on you know, on on a chain where the cost of like minting an NFT is not really high, uh, both the environmental cost as well as the uh, economic cost. Um, yeah, so um, that's just uh, and ultimately, like I'm not sure the proof of work is necessarily safer than proof of stake, right? There is like um, there's different arguments to that. There's different levels um, how you can look at it, and if you look, um, um, so so I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say that like a um, the blockchain being proof of work makes it like 10 times safer than, than, than Ethereum, for instance, um, if it moves to proof of stake. But obviously that needs to be, it still remains to be proven when when the merge happens. Oh, so I, I just quickly touch upon the three ways in which at Step In we take this seriously and are doing efforts. Um, just to give context, when Step In was conceived, uh, there were Australian bushfires going on. Um, and the founders were concerned about that in the backdrop of how we can do more in the blockchain ecosystem um, through gamification, through game apps, through health and lifestyle. So in the context of that, um, Stepin was born. And that's why these um, desire to 
contribute positively towards carbon neutrality is taken very seriously. So the first way uh, we do this is commit 100,000 US dollar every month to remove carbon credits of blockchain in partnership with Nori. Um, second is, like uh, Rafael here suggested, we've built on Solana as well, which is a proof of stake chain and um, therefore uses lesser energy than proof of work. And last but not the least, uh, we have 3 million users going every month and over 150,000 users every minute running outdoors. There's a reason why our app doesn't work in gyms, indoors or machines, because we want people to move outdoors. And in all of our on offline events on ground, we see our community members coming from come every country across Australia, Japan, Vietnam, US, UK, um, where they go outdoors and run with their families, children, pet. And it's very heartening to see this kind of impact directly on consumers. Over to you, Andre. Thank you, Shiti. Uh, in the environment uh, waste management industry, they make money two ways. They make money collecting uh, garbage waste uh, from municipal governments and uh, private entities. And the second one is they separate the waste and they sell it uh, after I've identified what waste can be sold as a prime resource or feedstock to the recycling company so that they can do new packaging from recovered materials. We decided to create a utility of the NFT by converting the invoices that are generated during the course of this huge billion dollar waste management industry that hasn't changed in 50 years by saying you can convert uh, the proof uh, that you've sold something as into an NFT. And therefore, you will find an incentive, an economic incentive to become transparent across the world. So the world will know exactly what are you recovering and what types of plastics you're recovering. Uh, and then also by that additional revenue stream, by imposing via smart contract a significant portion into green initiatives, where in uh, developing nations, they can pass on the money uh, to the pickers who can also be incentivized to collect more waste and to sort of have a, a social impact by increasing their uh, income. Therefore, <clears throat> sorry, the idea behind the utility NFT uh, consists of really providing, sorry, <laughs> it's good. Barcelona, <laughs> the, the plantain tree. The pollution, no? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, it's all the uh, miners. Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. The utility function ultimately of the NFT is to provide the guarantee that plastics have been recovered and to know how much and what type and to provide these uh, guarantees to the consumers and producers of plastics so they precisely can not only do the uh, proverbial offsetting of their plastic consumption, but more importantly, they can provide a new revenue source for the actual pickers in the, in, in, in the areas that really need uh, funding for this to happen. So this is how the NFT became uh, for us a tool because it is a business model, more than a technology. It just so happened to be blockchain based, obviously. So you can you can trace it, you can track it, and you can prove that it's uh, it, it being verified. But from a business model perspective, we needed a tool that would allow an industry that hadn't changed for 50 years to become transparent and to prove to all of us that they're actually doing their job in collecting plastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. I, this is an amazing discussion. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, we will just, I will end with a quote from my favorite person in crypto, one of my favorite people in crypto, Lynn Alden, who spoke at the Oslo Freedom Forum this week. Um, I actually don't know, didn't verify that this was from that event, but she said, energy serves a very important role. It minimizes human governments. If you remove the energy component, you're recreating the legacy system, but on a blockchain. Sorry to end with that note, but I just wanted to build on what you were saying, um, Andre, about legacy systems and how we can change them. And that's another perspective. Had to bring in the Bitcoin perspective because we don't have it on the panel. So thank you all so much. Um, sorry to cut our conversation short. Hopefully we can meet again someday. Thank you, Olivia. Thank, thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you all for your time.